So last fall, in addition to doing the two static piles, the Jerry Gillespie or Spice pile, which is an anaerobic windrow, we also did a aerated static pile or windrow, two 40-foot lengths. And the third one we did was a Johnson Sioux compost. So here I'm showing the bedding pack material from the bedding pack barn and you can see it's pretty dry. Um, you should be able to squeeze it and get at least one drop out of it, you know, 60 to 70 percent moisture content. It does have a fair amount of brown carbon in terms of straw and old hay and corn stalks and so on mixed in. And in addition to that, we also Uh, included some wood chipping. So this is a, from a maple tree, so leaves and wood chips from a local tree trimming service. And we're going to go ahead and mix those two together and wet them. And actually to wet them, what we did is we spread them out about a 6 to 12 inch layer after we mix it together. And then we put one of those oscillating uh, fan type sprinklers on the top and let it run for a day or so until it was wetted well enough. This is our tote actually that we put together. Now, I should mention when you look at this tote, you can see on the outside here that we do not have landscaping fabric, which is what David Johnson and his wife, Haching Sue, recommend. Uh, we decided not to do that because you know, they're doing it out west where it's very dry and hot. And we're going to be putting this in the bottom of a barn over winter where it's going to be warm at best and damp. So I was concerned that, you know, it would actually be too enclosed. You, you want it to be breathable from the outside as well as the tubes. So uh, I've seen other guys making enclosures for Johnson Sioux compost and the outs outside perimeter was not breathable and I do not think that's a good idea. I think that material along the outside is going to go anaerobic on you. So we decided to use this, um, it's just a nylon fencing, a couple layers of it and you can see I just took a single wire and just kind of wove it around which actually worked well and then we used the stays on the tote itself to actually tie off our four inch tubing i don't have all the rest of the four inch tubing in there yet um, but this turned out to be actually too dry which surprised me so the outside got too dry so we are in the next tote that we do this year we are going to actually use the landscaping fabric so in the bottom of the tote um I drilled out to receive the four inch tubing and you need to have a tube every, so no tube is more than 12 inches apart and more than 12 inches from the outside. And actually I wanna mention that again, David Young from, David Young, that's Y-O-U-N-G from uh, Young Red Angus Farms, he's done some really nice videos so on YouTube, so I recommend you look that up. So there's the bottom of our tote. Uh, I put some of that fencing on the bottom because of the um, all the additional holes that came actually in the bottom there. I didn't drill those smaller holes in there. And to keep material from falling through. So that's basically what our tote looks like. And what I wanted to talk about just briefly is um, the challenges of doing a tote in winter. I'm just going to touch on that lightly, but also in particular, I want to talk about um, you know what to put in your what materials you should use to make your compost, as well as this discussion on you know biostimulants or what's actually happening with this Johnson Sioux material. I mean, we know this stuff, when it gets made well, is highly fungal. 
So you can go on to the internet and search for BEAM, that's B as in boy, E-A-M, compost, that's Johnson Soup Compost, and you can buy the stuff. But one of the interesting things there is they have a PLA, PLFA lab results, and you can look and see what the bacterial and fungal, total bacteria and total fungal counts are coming back as. And the total fungal counts are somewhere around 24,000. So just off the scale high in fungal counts. And what's interesting, like if you listen to, I don't have her name here in my notes, but if you listen to um, Professor Elaine Ingham, she'll talk about, you know, aerated compost. She talks a lot about aerated compost tea and um, the importance of having the right mix of beneficial microbes. So um, take it to the point where you get flagellates and you've got lots of clumps of organic matter, so masses of bacterium and organic matter mixed together and lots of signs of humic acid. And, you know, you'll find some fungal hyphae, but it's really tough to get fungal hyphae. And I'll talk about that later in other videos that I'm gonna, that we've done actually on compost tea. So, uh, and again, in case you're not up on this, compost tea is different than compost extract. So when you make a tea, you're taking the same materials, base material, which is compost, a really good compost, but then you're adding foods to it. So fish oil and sugar, in, the, in, the, in our case, in the form of unsulfurated blackstrap molasses and so on. And you're brewing this by bubbling a lot of air through it um, for you know 24 to 36 to 48 hours until you get this huge bloom of microbes within there. And that's totally different than extract, um, where you just flush water through compost, you know, 30 minutes later, you're good to go. So, but what Professor Ingham is, talks about is, you know, just how powerful that compost tea can be. So, okay, so is it the microbes? Is it all the microbes in there doing it? Well, if you listen to soil ecologist, Christine Jones, who is really up on this stuff and definitely well worth listening to. She's got videos on YouTube. She talks about compost and she says, you know, the fermented compost, like a Korean natural farming or the Bokashi compost are really good, even better because of the, you know, quote unquote, biostimulants that are in there. So the thinking is, is, you know, there's various chemical signals within the water that comes from, that's passed through compost and that permeates into the seed and informs the seed into what, as to what environment it's going into. And so is that what's doing is it? Is it that we should have more fermented compost? You know, in which case maybe a vermicompost or uh, AKA a worm compost would do really well because that's been passed through the guts of worms and totally fermented. And she even mentions that. Or is it what David Johnson is talking about? So with the Johnson Sioux compost, this stuff is gone for, you know, a year plus and starts out with a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio and basically what David Johnson says is you know by the time it gets done it it looks like putty and I'll show you a video of that later on um, but it basically looks like putty it's the consistency of putty and it's and um, it's completely devoid of any active biology because everything essentially has been consumed so and I can confirm that actually looking under the microscope just with the material that we made, the Johnson Sue that we made, which did have a putty-like consistency by the time it got to the end. But I don't think we had the right mix of uh, components. I think too much manure and not enough carbon um, and maybe not enough leaves actually and smaller materials. But anyway, what he says, Professor Johnson says and his wife, Hei Chin Su, that it's actually um, the fungal spores. So, and th this 
huge. So, so everything's consumed, but what happens is during that consumption process, the fungi proliferate and go throughout the whole mass. And then later on, once everything's starting to get consumed and the fungi are near end of life, they sporulate. So they produce, you know, millions and millions of spores. So this material is completely consumed, but it has within it the cyst form of all these bacterium and a vastly diverse array because it's had so long to um, be worked on by the bacteria and fungi and a vast array of uh, different type of fungi. So, you know, David Johnson mentions that, you know, they're looking for like millions, applying somewhere around millions of um, bacterium and I think it was 15,000 spores per square foot when they're doing the extract. So it is super dense with those, with bacteria and fungi spores. So which is it? Well, uh, I, my feeling is, is it's more along the lines of what, I don't think the other two are wrong, but I think it's more along the line of what David Johnson is saying, which is start with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio material and babysit it and get it to be completely consumed, adding in your worms, you know, once it starts to cool down around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're going to have, like I said, a putty light material that's just just saturated with um, bacteria and fungi. And then those, when they go in furrow, you basically have, you know, any number of, of different types or a vast number of different types of bacterium and fungi waiting and then depending on what the plant needs and the exudates the sugars it produces and exudes through its roots th those microbes will be there in some number and start to take off so you know we have heard from others that they like to use like 40 percent green 40 percent ground brown 20% manure. I mean, it's a common recipe that you hear, but I think that's not the best for this Johnson Sioux material. Um, in fact, I want to, I've got two pictures here. This is from a video done by, I'll show it to you here. It's the um, Colorado, Colorado State University in conjunction with um, David Johnson and his wife. And this was out in Colorado, Southern Colorado, um, where they took a whole hoop house because of course it gets very cold there. And they put these large square bales around the outside. They had a floor made up of um, pallets which they had drilled holes through. And then every foot they had four inch piping coming down through it and yeah so made a huge pile of this stuff and put it in a hoop house to keep it warm over winter and I definitely want to call this guy's name is David West who did this out there in Colorado call and talk to him about it because I'm wondering you know what kind of insulation or cover he had on the top he did say he was watering it for a time anyway and you know what additional insulation he had to do because um, it's cold out there where he is. I looked it up. They have, you know, 7,000, roughly 7,600 uh, heating degree days. And in Wisconsin, where we are, it's only 6,800. So they're even colder than we are. He did say that they put in extra um, manure to make sure the pile heated up. But if you look at what they used, you can see here, here's a picture of it from the video. And, you know, cattails, cereal straw, sheet manure, and wood chips. So a lot of carbon. But like I said, he did say he put in the extra, a little extra sheet manure because he wanted to make sure that the pile reached the um, required 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. So, but yeah, so um, I think what you put in the mix that you have should be very carbon, high in carbon, but enough nitrogen so that it f fires up. And, you know, here's someone out in Colorado where it's cold, 
which is what we're dealing with in Wisconsin. And having this stuff go over winter, you know, another question I would have for them is, you know, how, how cold did your pile get? You know, did it, was there enough heat coming off of it? Because these piles do continue to heat even after they come down from that, you know, 130, 140, 150 degree Fahrenheit initial temperature in the first couple weeks or so, they do continue to heat. So was that enough in addition to, you know, the passive solar that it was picking up from the, through the hoop house that the pile stayed warm? Apparently it was, but how warm is kind of what I'm interested in and, and also, you know, his lab results. So if I get a chance to talk to him, I'll try and include um, the content of that discussion with him later on.